last week we started talking about merchandising, and this is a continuation of that. If you've got a um, bright colored pen, a red pen with you, this would be a good time to get it out and use to edit that information that's in front of you on your handout today. I literally took last time's handout and did a save as and edited it to become this. And I literally took last time's presentation and did a save as and edited it into this. If you looked at the syllabus, you know that this is chapter five again. We rarely spend two weeks on a chapter. We've divided it into perpetual last week and periodic this week. So there's a little reminder in the syllabus and on the handout and on the screen about the pages that you were responsible for last week. And I hope you've mastered that. If you have a good idea about the concepts that we were trying to get you to understand last week, this week's going to be easier for you. If you didn't master that, then you've got some catching up to do. You need to kick it into high gear and accomplish that. There are only a few pages in the chapter that we're concerned with. And it's just a few things that are different about it. We're concerned this week about the entries necessary for periodic procedures and the financial statement formulas involved in presenting that information on the income statement. So that's perhaps the newest part. Knowing how to write it down and tell other people about it would be the thing that you'd want to concentrate on the most. If you've looked at the syllabus, you know that there are a couple of handouts assigned for later in the week. They're available to you on D2L and on the class website. So before you need to find them, you ought to try to find them in case there's some technical difficulties that we need to help you iron out. We've put the case itself, the problem itself. We've put an Excel file that you could solve and turn it in class or solve and put in the Dropbox. You could print from that. If you want to turn in a printed version, you could submit it directly to the Dropbox. It's just like all the others, except it's one that we prepared instead of one that the publisher prepared. So there's two of them available there. This is what it looks like on D2L. They're handout 5-1A and 5-2A, the two handouts, the problems themselves, and then the two Excel files to get to. If you've got a question about that, I'd be glad to entertain it after class today. Let's talk about this contrast that we're attempting to accomplish between perpetual procedures and periodic procedures. Last week, we talked about periodic being the one that provided us information occasionally, the one that we've used the longest, the one that has been our traditional best choice. And perpetual, which needs a more sophisticated accounting system in order to continuously disclose the amount of inventory on hand. In other words, the computer has to be updated every time we buy goods and every time we sell goods. That would be a huge task for us to accomplish as humans, as individuals, but with the help of technology, we're able to do it. The premise here is, what if there were no technology? What if we didn't have the resources? What if we're a small business and don't need those resources or don't have those resources initially and we've got goods to account for? How are we going to do this? How are we going to accomplish that if that's the circumstance? Last week's assumption was we had the technology. This week's assumption is we don't have the technology. Let's review perpetual as we go through this and let's talk about what's new with periodics so that we could introduce you to the terminology and the account titles and the journal entries and ultimately how this information gets reported to others on the income statement. So, we talked last week about some new accounts and we have those new accounts, some additional new accounts to add to that list this week. We have some new transactions to record. There are buyers and sellers and freight and returns and discounts and payment and receipt of cash. They're the ones that you're more familiar with this week than you were last. We've got new details to provide on the income statement. That must be the third time I've mentioned that today. That's the big looming thing that's on the horizon here. Last week, 
this very slide said that inventory was the account in which we recorded goods that we acquired. What kind of an account is inventory class? As 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 an asset. It goes on the balance sheet. We're still going to have an inventory account, but we're not going to re record the goods that we acquire in that account. We're still going to have an inventory account, but we're not keeping up with it all the time. Instead, we're going to have an account called purchases. Its long name is purchases of merchandise. If you buy equipment, it doesn't go here. If you buy supplies, it doesn't go here. It's only if you buy merchandise that you plan to sell to others that it goes here. Now, think back to the definitions of periodic and perpetual and think about this change that I described just now. Last week, under perpetual procedures that kept up with it all the time, we debited inventory. We want to know about the ebb and flow of inventory. We want to keep up with it all the time. But in periodic, we don't keep up with it all the time. Instead of debiting the asset account inventory, we debit the account purchases. Purchases is an expense. Earlier this semester, in another chapter, we talked about debiting rent expense or prepaid rent, debiting prepaid insurance or insurance expense, debiting supplies or debiting supplies expense, and called them the asset method and the expense method. And you were hoping we'd never revisit them. Here we are, calling them periodic and perpetual, when really they are the asset method and the expense method. The periodic system is the expense method. It's on the screen. We're debiting purchases and expense account. The method you were introduced to last week, perpetual, is the asset method. We debited inventory and asset account. What did we learn about asset method and expense method earlier in the year about the conclusion that we reached? Did it matter which way we went? they both took us to the same place ultimately. Isn't that true? That is true of periodic and perpetual. We're going to get the same answer sooner or later. It's just how we get there that matters. Let's get there. This is a purchases account. It's an expense. It's the account in which we record acquisitions of goods that we plan to sell to others and we want to record them at cost. That was true last week, and it remains true this week. Cost includes not just the invoice price we pay for those goods, but all the things that it takes to get those goods to you and ready for you to use. The biggest difference is freight. We learned last week, hopefully, that freight is part of the cost of these goods. When we were using perpetual procedures, we debited inventory for the freight cost. We're going to use a separate account, freight in. Some people call it transportation in. We're going to call it freight in. Freight in is part of the debit side of purchases. When accounts have a relationship to another account like this and they're opposite, we call them contra. Drawing was contra capital and accumulated depreciation was contra asset and sales returns and allowances is contra revenue. To my knowledge, there is no standardized term to describe this relationship. Contra means opposite. This relationship is that purchases balance is debit and freight ends balance is debit. What are you going to do when you combine these two accounts? Are you going to add them or subtract them? Yeah. You're going to add them. There is no special word to describe this relationship. If you and a friend of yours or a, a colleague at work someday go to different schools, you should both know what contra is. Did you hear me? Contra is a standardized word. Everybody who takes accounting ought to know about contra. You should be able to get to work someday and use the term contra and somebody would know what you're talking about. I'm about to make up a word that's just our word. This relationship where they're both the same, I'm going to call sub. This is a sub-purchases account. 
It is added to purchases. It's the same as purchases. It's part of purchases. Some people don't even have a freight in account. They just debit purchases. They don't want to know. If we want to know, we're going to keep it in a separate account. But in a few minutes, we're going to add it to purchases. It's not contra. It's not subtracted from. It's sub. It's added to. Are you with me right this minute? Say yes. yes. Let's talk about other new accounts. Purchases has the potential of us sending some goods back or us being satisfied with these goods to the extent that the supplier from whom we bought these goods would be willing to reduce the price to keep us happy. We experienced sales returns and allowances from the seller's point of view. This is purchases returns and allowances from the purchaser's point of view. When we send goods back or when we get a reduced price, we're going to credit purchases returns and allowances Purchases, returns, and allowances is contra purchases. It goes on the income statement. It's closed. Could we figure out which step? We say revenue, expense, income, summary, and draw. <coughs> when we'd be better off saying nominal credits, nominal debits, income, <coughs> summary, and draw. This account has a credit balance. In which step should purchases, returns, and allowances be closed? In the first step, is this revenue? No. no, it's not revenue, but it's closed in the first step. It's a nominal account with a credit balance. We close them in the first step. We're also going to have an account called purchases discount in which we record cash discounts. Last week I specifically asked you to write down the term cash discounts in the market. <coughs> because I could have said it 25 times and you wouldn't have because it never appeared on the screen. The type of discount we're calculating is a cash discount. When we pay on time, we wind up paying less for these goods than we initially recorded them. From the seller's point of view, you're familiar with sales discount. Now we're introducing purchases discount as a contra purchases account. Its normal balance is credit. It goes on the income statement. It's closed in the first step of closing entries with other nominal accounts that have credit balances. Are you with me right this minute? Yes or no? Yes. Good. Now, on the screen right this minute, this looks pretty straightforward and simple. If I wanted to know the true amount I spent for the goods I bought, I would want to know what's inside that yellow circle. Yes? I think you can help me with this. Let's start with the balance of purchases. And do what with freight in? Add or subtract. Uh -huh. And do what with this? Uh -huh. And do what with this? Uh -huh. The result of that, purchases plus freight in minus returns, allowances, and discounts is what we would call net purchases if we're thinking like net sales last week. The bottom line result, the true amount I spent for the goods I bought is inside that yellow circle. That seems apparent to you right this minute, I hope. It should. In a few minutes, when we decide to write it down on a piece of paper and use columns to present the information, and in your homework problems this week when you're asked to do the same thing, keep it this simple. Remember what you're trying to accomplish. When we start writing it down, somehow we lose this simplicity and we fall into I've got to memorize this. I've got to look at an example how to do this. I can't figure it out on my own. Keep it this simple. I think you understand it at the moment. Last week, we introduced you to a sales account. It's a revenue account. It's got a credit balance. It goes on the income statement. It gets closed in the first step of closing entries. It has two accounts related to it, sales returns and allowances and sales discounts. And this situation, is the same under periodic and perpetual. There's nothing new here. Isn't that nice? Rest in that. Understand that. If I want to know the true amount of revenue I earned, it's inside that yellow circle. When I get ready to do the income statement, I'm going to subtract returns, allowances, and discounts from sales to get the true amount of revenue I earned. Let's talk about last week's account 
cost of good solving. We had a computer and the technology to keep up with increases and decreases in inventory as they occurred. We took for granted. And in the background, there's all sorts of activity going on. At the cash register, when we sold an item, the asset on the shelf became an expense, what we call the cost of goods sold. At any one point in time, under perpetual procedures, we should be able to go to the computer and type in the account number and know the balance of inventory and know the amount of cost of goods sold. It's an account under perpetual procedures. It doesn't exist under periodic procedures. <clears throat> under periodic procedures, we debit purchases and expense when we acquire the goods. And we make no entry at the cash register to record the fact that the asset on the shelf became an expense as it passed the cash register on its way to the trunk of the car. <coughs> there is no such account as cost of goods sold under periodic procedures. It's a calculation that we need to learn to make. It's one of our challenges this week. These are the same entries I introduced you to merchandising with last week. These are the very same entries you've seen already. If we encountered this week purchased merchandise from a seller, FOB Shipping Point 210 Net 30, using last week's answer, perpetual debit inventory, credit accounts payable, we need to know that some of those things are the same, some of them are different. Have you been paying attention today? Got out your red pen? How could we edit this entry to make last week's entry this week's entry? What volunteer in the room would do this for me real quickly? Aline? Debit purchases instead of inventory? Instead of debiting inventory, we're going to debit an account called purchases. We're going to debit purchases and expense account instead of debiting inventory. We're no longer going to keep up with it all the time. We're debiting purchases. Last week, about this time, you saw an entry where we paid for freight charges on those goods that we just acquired. Last week, we were concerned with the true cost of the inventory. We debited inventory. This week, we're going to debit, I need a hand up. Anybody but a link, Talon. Freight in. It's called freight in. This week, we debited purchases for the goods. We're debiting freight in for the freight. Debit freight in credit cash. What kind of an account is freight in class? Sub it's sub purchases. What's going to happen to freight in when we get ready to prepare the income statement? We're going to add it to purchases. This is just like debiting purchases. It's the same thing. Debit freight in credit cash. Last week you saw an entry that said we return some goods and receive credit. Last week I gave you advice, look back. When we looked back last week, we saw that we had debited inventory and credited accounts payable. We did the opposite to undo it. This week when we look back, we see that we didn't debit inventory. What did we debit originally? We debited purchases. So what should I credit to undo the entry I made a few minutes ago, may I have another volunteer? Yes, ma'am. It's called purchases, returns, and allowances. Thank you very much. Instead of crediting inventory, we're going to credit purchases, returns, and allowances. How's this working for you? Are you following along? Yes or no? Yes. Is this working? Yes. Good. What kind of an account is purchases, returns, and allowances class? This is asset liability, capital revenue expense, fill in the blank, say anything you want to say, get full credit, just first time you go. Contra. This is contra purchases, or you could say contra expense. Purchases is an expense. It's contra expense or contra purchases. I hope you're with me. Then we paid for the goods on time. When we paid for the goods on time last week, 
We debited accounts payable for the full balance. We weren't going to owe anything. We credited cash for something less than that. And then to get the entry to balance, we credited inventory because we were keeping up with all the changes in inventory as they occurred. It was perpetual inventory. We wanted to know all the time. The true cost of those goods was this credit to cash. We had to reduce inventory by that amount of the discount. How will shifting from perpetual, this entry on the screen, to periodic cause that entry to be different? If you see the difference, and it'll say it to me out loud, raise your hand real quickly, let's go. Talk to me, Daniel. So we're going to credit purchase discount. Instead of inventory, yeah. we're going to credit purchases <coughs> discount. Purchases discount is what kind of an account class? Fill in the blank. I heard a lot of answers, but I didn't hear one clearly enough to call it. Somebody say it to me again. Say it to me. It's contra expense is one correct way to say it. It's contra specifically to the purchases account. It's contra purchases. Who's with me right this minute? Let me see hands. Real good. Good. Thank you. So, could we post to purchases and see what happened? We bought $1,000 worth of goods. We paid $100 in freight. We returned some goods and we paid for them on time and took advantage of the cash discount they allowed us. Do the math with me. Not literally, just, just say what you would do. $1,000. Plus or minus this. Plus. Plus. plus or minus this. Minus. Plus or minus this. Minus. If we determined what was inside that circle right this minute, what name would we give it? That, uh, we're we're going to call that net purchases temporarily. I, I was thinking that's the cost of these purchases. Just like it was the cost of the inventory when we were using perpetual. It's the cost of the goods. Are you with me? Yeah. Yes or no? Yeah. We're still interested in that. It's just all those other accounts that are related to purchases that should be combined with purchases ultimately to get the answer. The sales entries are slightly different. Even though you saw a few minutes ago the sales account and the two accounts related to it, and they seem the same as last week, there is a little minor difference. It takes two entries under perpetual procedures to record a bleep at the cash register. We're earning revenue. We're incurring a cost. You should have walked in the room today knowing that. It takes two entries to record a sale. Under periodic procedures, we make no attempt to keep up with the changes in inventory as they occur. We ignore the problem. Right at this point is when our problems begin. I'm not through with this yet, but I'm trying to get your attention to let you realize it is at this point that the rest of today is our attempt to solve this problem. And one way, I debate every year whether to use this illustration, and when I don't, I regret it sooner or later. Can you imagine not having the technology, but standing behind my wife at the grocery store where we had to look up each of these items individually to make the second entry? Let me tell you that my wife hates to buy groceries. I mean, literally hates to buy groceries. And when she buys groceries, she can get more in a shopping cart than is humanly possible because she doesn't want to come back. While she's there, she's going to get it all. You with me? She hates to buy groceries. I sh if I truly wanted peace and harmony at home, I'd take over that responsibility, but I'm not going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> and I may show her this tape, and I may not. I'm still debating over that. <laughs> you know, I'll help her get the groceries from the car to the house, and I'll help her put them in the shelves, but I feel like she ought to be the one that knows what's in the cabinet in the refrigerator. I, I don't cook. I, she doesn't either. But that's another story too. Maybe. Okay, enough about the person. Could you imagine for a moment not having technology, 
but being the person in line behind my wife in the checkout line. If they had to look up every item in some catalog, in some price list, to not only ring up retail, but to ring up cost as well, do you want to be behind her in the checkout line? No. We don't want to take that much time in our store. Now, my illustration is about one customer, but think about our store. If we have to look up retail, we don't. We put price tags on them, or, or, or we're going to, you know, you've still been to some store, haven't you, where the clerk looks at it and has to ring it up? Yes? Yeah. Yes. Yes? Yes? Looks at the item, it's got the price tag on it, and they ring it up and put it on this conveyor belt and it goes on down to be sacked? Yes? Yes. Thank goodness. <laughs> but what if we had to look up cost, too? Wouldn't that be a pain? Wouldn't that be time consuming? One of the reasons I don't shop at Walmart across the street is because the checkout lines are as slow as they are now, and we've got the technology, and all we're ringing up is retail, and the computer's ringing up this second entry. Are you feeling the pain I'm trying to create right here? Do you want to be behind my wife in the checkout line? Or do we want to run a store that the checkout lines are so clogged up that nobody wants to come and shop at our store. That's where I'm really going with this. Under periodic procedures, we don't make this second entry. That's where the problem begins. We ring up retail at the cash register and we make no entry for the change that occurred in inventory. We make no entry for the expense we incur at the cash register. Mark this moment in your mind. It is this moment where the problem started. We're going to solve the problem today and this week. So, if we don't make that entry, what else do we do? Well, what if some of those goods came back? We learned last week that we would look back and undo the revenue that we earned and undo the second transaction at the cash register, and if we didn't make this second entry at the cash register, then we don't make that second entry for the return. Under periodic procedures, we record the revenue, make no entry for the cost. We record the return, the revenue we didn't earn, but we make no entry to record the inventory being placed back on the shelf. So let me summarize what you just heard in a different way. We debit purchases when we acquire goods under periodic procedures. At the cash register, we record the revenue that we earn. We credit sales for the revenue that we earn, but we make no entry to record the reduction in inventory. And that's where the problem starts. Therefore, because of this, this, we have no choice but to compute cost of goods sold. Under perpetual procedures, cost of goods sold is an account that we keep up with all the time. Under periodic procedures, cost of goods sold is a calculation, a formula that I would love for you to learn today and know the rest of your life. What is cost of equipment minus accumulated depreciation? Everybody said? Speak up. Okay. That has absolutely nothing to do with this except for my passion that I would like you to know this. So let's talk about cost of goods sold and the calculations we make. So thus endeth the contrast between periodic and perpetual and thus beginneth what I call financial statement formulas. I believe there are seven formulas on a periodic income statement that you should be familiar with that I would love for you to know. Cost of goods sold being one of them. Let's talk about the formulas we need to know. Well last week I used this very slide to introduce you to gross profit. 
sales minus cost of goods sold is gross profit. But we know that sales in that description is really <coughs> net sales. That we have to reduce sales by the returns, allowances, and discounts to get net sales. It is really net sales minus cost of goods sold that is gross profit. You knew that last week. It's still true this week. Net sales minus cost of goods sold is gross profit. There's another one. Here's net sales inside that yellow circle we already talked about. Here's the format we used to get net sales last week. Same thing this week. It is net sales that's the true amount of revenue I earned. <coughs> last week, we were able to look in the computer and no cost of goods sold. It took us one line. This week, it'll take us several lines to show our work. And by the way, when you're asked to do this in your homework this week, don't think one line is good enough. If you calculate it on a piece of scratch paper and show it on one line, like some examples in the book, perpetual, you looked at the wrong example and you'll get an NC. This week, you need to show the details, like you'll see later today in this class. Let's talk about cost of goods sold. It's a formula. It's not an account anymore. The formula is what we have to start with, our beginning inventory, plus everything we bought. Oops, another footnote. Is called goods available for sale. That's what we could have possibly sold to our customers. Only two things can happen to those goods. We either sold them or we didn't. If we subtract out the goods that we didn't sell, we can logically conclude that we sold the rest. Now this is the most logical formula we will encounter this year. There is absolutely no reason that you couldn't see its logic today and remember it and not memorize it. If you will play along with me today, you will understand this before you leave the room. And at any time the rest of the year or your life, I can ask you what the cost of goods sold formula is, and you should be able to figure it out on your own. What you have to start with, plus everything you buy, is what you could possibly sell to your customers. Only two things can happen. You either sold it to them or you didn't. We're not going to keep up with the goods we sold to them, therefore we have to keep up with the goods that are still here. If we subtract the goods we didn't sell, we can conclude we sold the rest and call it cost of goods sold. Let's talk about the footnotes. I wanted us to be able to say that formula together. I didn't want to talk about all the details that it takes to get us purchases. In the formula you just saw on the screen it said plus purchases. But when I say purchases, I really mean net purchases. What we've used to describe as net purchases today in this room on a couple of occasions. What you saw inside that yellow circle a minute ago, what you saw with numbers involved, I asked you, would you add this or subtract this or add this, and you got it right. That was to prepare you for this moment. We call it purchases just because we're lazy talkers, just so we can stay together. But it's really the true amount inside that yellow circle that we spent that we want enough. Purchases is net purchases. Now, I think we ought to do it just the way you saw it on the screen. I think we ought to start with purchases, add in the freight, get, take out the returns allowances and take out the discounts. This is exactly what you saw inside the yellow circle. Are y'all looking for a place to write that down? And it's not there? Then no, just hang with me right here. You've seen it other places. I think this is what we've established today that's inside the yellow circle. Agree with me, please. Yes. yes, that's pretty much it. When you get ready to look at the book's example, and you will, I hope, to do your homework, then you're going to start with purchases just like we did. But the book subtracts out returns, allowances, and discounts first. And they call that net purchases. Isn't that a pity? 
sales money, sales returns, allowances, and discounts is net sales, wouldn't it be nice if this plus this minus this minus this is net purchases, wouldn't that be an easy thing to remember, a nice parallel? Yes? What's wrong with this being called net purchases? Is that the true amount you spent for the goods you bought? What's missing? Well, then the book adds in the freight to get what they call cost of goods purchased. That's a nice name. Cost of goods purchased. That's what we wanted to know. But I think this is cost of goods purchased. I see the potential for some confusion here that would cause you to get it right, uh, get it wrong in your homework or get it wrong on the test. And that's not my desire. I do not want you to miss a question on the test because I brought this up today. Because there's a difference in the way the book treats freight. They add it in last, I add it in first. Big deal. Because you're going to use the book's example, I'm suggesting that we go with the book's alternative. Okay, I'm going to give up. I'm going to acquiesce to the book's way of doing it. We're going to have two subtotals. We're going to want to know this one only. After we've added in the freight and subtracted out everything else, it's this number that we agree on. What we label it is not nearly as important as getting the number. Cost of goods purchased is purchases and everything related to it combined. Are we in one accord right this minute? Yes or no? We're going with the book's answer, the book's approach. We're going to add in freight at the end because that's the example you have to look upon to do your homework. Pretend with me that we all work for the same company. Let's learn how to calculate cost of goods sold once and for all. Pretend with me that today's the first day of the year, and when we came to work today, there was this much on hand. There is a place for you to write this down. There's a little box in your note-taking guide if you want to start there. If we looked on the shelves, this is the sum of all the goods we had on the shelves when we got to work today, the first day of the year. And all year long, we buy things, and we buy things, and we buy things, Y'all are aware that there's an elevator back here, aren't you? We'll call it the freight elevator. And that's where goods arrive. And in that storeroom, we prepare the goods for sale. And we bring them out and we put them on the shelves. And we buy goods and we unpack them. And we prepare them for sale. And goods just keep arriving. And the shelves just keep getting fuller and fuller and fuller. Are you with me? Yes or no? And every morning at 9 o'clock, one of us walks over to the neon light in the window and flicks it on. What does the neon light in the window say? Open. It says open. And we don't literally, but when we flick on the neon sign and it flashes open and we unlock the front door, we don't literally, but figuratively speaking, we step out onto the sidewalk and we scream, I got goods for sale. Did you hear me? They probably did in the humanities area too. And they think I've fallen off my rocker. If I sold anything, it's just a huge invitation, folks. Flick on the neon sign, unlock the front door. And, and scream to the world, look at these full shelves. They're either what I had to start with or something I've acquired since. Come on in, pick a shopping cart, take something off the shelf, walk by the cash register, make me happy. If they buy anything at all, they bought what we had to start with or something we acquired since. That's why we call it goods available for sale. Only two things can happen to those goods. We either sold them or we didn't. If we subtract from that those goods that we did not sell, we're left with the goods we did sell. That's cost of goods sold. You ought to think about every word in that description. No, they're not scrabble letters drawn at random out of a fishbowl and pronounced. No, 
their words carefully chosen to communicate to you and others what they are. This is the expense that we incurred for the goods that we don't have anymore. Cost of goods sold. It ought to make sense. It is the beginning inventory plus the purchases. That's goods available for sale. Goods available for sale minus ending inventory is cost of goods sold. Beginning inventory plus purchases. You know what that means, don't you? Everything inside the yellow circle is goods available for sale. Goods available for sale minus ending inventory is cost of goods sold. Say it with me. Beginning inventory. The formula for determining cost of goods sold is beginning inventory plus purchases is goods available for sale. You're not saying it. I repeat the middle one. Start with me. Goods available for sale. Minus ending inventory is cost of goods sold. Come on, do it one more time. The formula for determining cost of goods sold is beginning inventory plus purchases is goods available for sale. Goods available for sale minus ending inventory is cost of goods sold. I said it that way five times. Say it with me. Come on. Say the middle subtotal twice. The formula is beginning inventory plus purchases is goods available for sale. Goods available for sale minus ending inventory is cost of goods sold. Now we've slipped into road. It sounds like I'm trying to get you to memorize it, and I'm not. There is logic behind every one of those steps. I want you to see the logic. It's important that we get the ending inventory right because that's the amount we're going to show on the balance sheet as an asset. And the size of that yellow box also determines the size of the remaining rectangle. It's important we get that right because that's going to be the biggest expense on the income statement, cost of goods sold. So, let's see if we can do one in three minutes. Here's the list of accounts, similar to what you'll have in homework or real life. Let's do an income statement through gross profit. Let's put a good heading on it. And right after the good heading, let's start with sales. It's on the list. It's 300000 Is that truly the amount of revenue I earned? No. We're going to move over a column, subtract out returns and allowances of 1500 subtract out discounts of 3000 That sum of the two contra accounts, I'm moving back to the right-hand column, $4,500 of subtractions. I've got sales of 300000 I need to reduce it by the sum of these two contra accounts. That's net sales of 295000 From net sales, I want to subtract cost of goods sold. Cost of goods sold starts with beginning inventory. Beginning inventory was stated in the problem to be 22000 To beginning inventory, I want to add purchases. It starts with the amount $80,000. $80,000 is truly the amount, the amount I spent for the goods I bought? No. I need to subtract out the returns, allowances, and discounts first. $3,500 of returns, allowances, and $6,000 of discounts I took. I've got contra accounts totaling $9,500. I moved over, summed them, brought the result back. 80,000 minus 9,500 is what the book calls net purchases. I got 70,500. Is that truly the amount I spent for the goods I bought? No. no. Say yes or no. 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 We need to deal with the freight. The freight was $4,000. Let's add in the freight and determine that cost of goods purchased was $74,500. Now notice, in this column, with nothing obstructing them, I now have beginning inventory and purchases. They're in the same column, 
and it's obvious to everybody that's looking at this financial statement. There's not something extraneous interrupting that flow. Beginning inventory plus purchases is goods available for sale. I got 96500 We could do two things with those goods, sell them or not. If we subtract out the goods that we didn't sell, we can logically, logically conclude we sold the rest. 96.5 minus 30,000 is cost of goods sold of 66.5. And look, in this column, without any obstruction, there is sales, which is to be reduced by cost of goods sold to get gross profit. Gross profit in this problem is $229,000. You need to learn seven financial statement formulas. But in doing so, you need to learn how to present them to others in a good traditional format. Think about what column you're putting things in your homework and why you're doing it that way. I hope you learned something today. If I don't see you again, I hope you have a really, really nice, great, bad break.